Hey there, subscribe to my channel, and also press this bell icon so you never miss any new updates cause whenever we upload new video you will get a notification on your phone. The test is in 4 part, part 1, part 2, part 3, and part 4. Now look at part 1. Part 1. Here a student called Joanna, telling her friend about an arts festival, which is being held in the city where they are studying. First, you have some time to look at questions 1 and 2. Now we shall begin. You should answer the questions as you listen, because you will not hear the recording a second time. Listen carefully and answer questions 1 and 2. Hi, Joanna. Where have you been? Hi, Dave. I had to go into college to return a DVD I'd borrowed from the library. Oh, right. But while I was there, I got some information about the City Arts Festival that starts next week. Oh, yeah. I saw a poster advertising it somewhere. Yeah. And I picked up this leaflet from the library. It gives you the website address. So as I was there, I logged on to get more information. Actually, although they've got the full programme of events fixed now, you can't book online, which seems strange. There's a number to phone, though. Hmm. And are there student discounts? I guess so, but I didn't notice. Anyway, there are three things I'd like to see. An Italian film, a rock concert, and an art exhibition. Oh. <laughs> the exhibition's free, and you don't need to book, so I'll definitely go to that. But I'm going to get tickets for the film in case they sell out. Mm, good idea. You can always buy concert tickets at the door, because that's in a really big hall. Right. Before you listen to the rest of the conversation, you have some time to read questions 3 to 10. Now listen and answer questions 3 to 10. So, when does the festival actually start? Well, it's usually held the first week of October, but it's earlier this year for some reason. The opening night is September the 20th, and events go on till the end of the month. Hmm. And have you got that phone number? Yeah, it's here. Uh, look, it's 0967 990 OK, I'll write it down. 0967 990 Thanks. I thought the local council made a profit from the festival, but it says here that there's a commercial sponsor. It's a local bank. I didn't know that. Neither did I. What other events have they got on? Um, as well as the art exhibitions and stuff that's open every day, there are special events each day. Like on Monday, there's a musical in the City Hall. Yeah. That's only £3.65 for students. Mm, I think I'll give that a miss. I've got football training on Mondays, but I'm free on Wednesday. There's a jazz band on then, 
and that's only two pounds fifty for students. Sounds good. Is that in the city hall too? We could go. Well, I'm busy actually, but it's at the sports centre if you're interested. Oh, right. Thursday's the cheapest event, only one pound twenty-five for students, and it's on in the library. Can you guess what it is? <laughs> Probably the college choir. <laughs> Actually, no, they've not been asked. Apparently, oh, no, it's a poetry evening. Hmm, isn't there any modern dance on anywhere? On Friday, that's at the college. It's quite expensive, though, fifteen pounds for adults. And twelve pound seventy-five for students. Oh, yes, that is a lot. If I'm going to spend that much, I'd prefer to go out on Saturday. Yeah, me too. But on Saturday night, there isn't live music or a party or anything. Just the fireworks in the city park, and that's only one pound fifty. Yeah, that'd be good. That is the end of part one. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now it turns to part two. Part two. You will hear part of a talk about the design of the zip fastener. First, you have some time to look at questions eleven to fourteen. Now listen carefully and answer questions eleven to fourteen. I think you all have a copy of the printed notes and diagram, but I should point out before we go any further that there are a few mistakes in those notes. So please correct any you notice as we go along. Right, as you can see, we are going to be looking at the zip or zipper as it's known in the U.S., which is where it had its origins in 1851. In fact, it was initially given the rather less catchy name of the automatic continuous clothing closure by the person that invented it, Elias Howe, who also designed the first sewing machine. It wasn't until 1893, though, that someone actually tried to market the zip, when Whitcomb Judson, another American inventor, took what he called the clasp locker to the World's Fair held that year in the U.S. His hook and eye system was a commercial disaster. And it was another 15 years before the buying public began to take an interest. This time, a more reliable model with facing sets of teeth, named the hookless fastener, designed by a Swedish engineer called Gideon Sundback, attached to clothing, purses, and other items, it sold quite well. Gradually, this new alternative to buttons caught on, as people realized the advantages of a fastener that only needed one hand to operate. That children could use, that left no visible gaps, and so on. The British firm Kinnock began producing and selling the ready fastener in large numbers in 1919, and a few years later, the zipper, designed and given its modern American name by B. F. Goodrich, made Mr. Goodrich extremely rich indeed. Before you hear the rest of the program. You have some time to look at questions fifteen to twenty.
Now listen and answer questions 15 to 20. If its use in trousers was a major factor in establishing the zip as a fashion icon, despite its occasional tendency to trap parts of the wearer's anatomy, another major breakthrough came with the separable zip, the kind that opens at both ends. This type, still widely used in a range of items, from jackets to tents, is shown in the diagram. Let's look first at the right-hand side of the illustration, at the material attached to the uh, item of clothing, the bag, or whatever. This is the tape, which is usually made of fairly tough fabric. At the end of that, there's what is known as the heat seal patch, the cotton and nylon laminated material used to reinforce the tape. Now, alongside the heat seal patch is a small piece of metal used only on a separating zip, whose function is to enable the two halves of the zip to join. This is known as the pin. Opposite that, on the other half of the zip in the diagram, is a device which correctly aligns the pin. The box, as it's called, begins the joining of the zip halves. Running up the inside edge of each half are dozens, possibly hundreds, of metal teeth, each of which has a small hook and an equally tiny hollow. Moving up and down the teeth to open and close the zip is a piece of metal called the slider. This is operated by means of a pull tab, so-called because, logically enough, the wearer or user pulls it in one direction or the other. To close the zip, a wedge inside the slider pushes the hook of each tooth on one side into the hollow of each offset tooth on the other. To open it, the wedge forces them apart. To prevent the slider coming off the teeth at the other end, there is a top stop on both sides of the zip. This basic design has changed little in the many years since it was first introduced, although nowadays, of course, zips, uh, zippers, are available in a whole range of shapes, sizes, and materials. That is the end of part two. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now it turns to part three. Part three. You are going to hear a conversation on animal protection. First, you have some time to look at questions 21 to 25. Now listen to the tape and answer the questions. Thanks for joining us today, Mike. How did Baja California become a consideration for a condor release? Our recovery plan for California condors requires us to re-establish the birds in as much as their former range as possible. Baja, being the southernmost recent range for the California condor, works well in that they were only recently lost from the area mid-1930s, and considerable habitat still remains. It is very isolated with very few people in the area. The mountains are spectacular, ranging up to 10,000 feet, or 3,000 meters. Our selected release site is at nearly 8,000 feet, 2,400 meters. Mike, how many birds do you envision flying free in this area, Baja, in the future? We will be releasing four to eight birds on a yearly basis and will reconsider the situation when we have 20 birds in the area. What age do the birds have to be before moving them? That's a good question. Typically, we move them at eight months to 18 months old. Birds are ready to fledge, or leave, from the nest at six to seven months of age. In our current release group in Baja, we have birds as old as 30 months. It will be interesting to see how they behave. I expect that they will want to range more than younger birds and make it challenging for us to keep up. 
Is there a maximum number of birds a certain area can support? Yes, it's called the carrying capacity for any area, for any species. In our case, our strategy to find that number is to saturate the environment to a level where we determine that the birds are showing difficulty either in finding food, behaviorally, or in survivorship. That level is greatly determined by the availability of food in the area and nesting possibilities. Now look at questions 26 to 30. As the talk continues, answer questions 26 to 30. What do you hope to accomplish with this release in the long run? I expect that well within 10 years the condors will be flying north and joining birds already released in Southern California. Hopefully we will reach at least 150 birds in each of these populations within about 15 years. What would you say is the biggest contribution to the California Condor Program's success? That would have to be the fact that we were able to breed the birds in captivity from the 27 birds we started with in 1987 to the 205 birds we have today. This is thanks to cooperation between the San Diego Wild Animal Park, the Los Angeles Zoo, and the World Center for Birds of Prey in Bois, Idaho. Are there any problems keeping track of and protecting your released animals outside of the US? Nope. We are using radio transmitters and will be using the new satellite and GPS transmitters as well. Which system is better? Using satellites. The advantages over radio telemetry are numerous. It makes it possible to keep up with the bird's flight without being led miles in a matter of minutes. It took the young condor only a week to migrate across the state, and with just radio telemetry, poor weather can keep a plane grounded, and not all roads are accessible to track them on ground. New technology will allow one to be able to track birds that are not accessible by plane. Also, it is a new way to gauge the effectiveness of reintroduction. How so? If a condor transmitter works properly, researchers will get a location every 10 days for about two years. Do you see an end in sight for the need to breed condors in captivity? Yes, that would be great. But it will take a while for us to establish the two wild populations and make sure that they are sustainable. Part of our recovery is to maintain a captive flock of 150 birds in various zoos around the country as a safety net for the future. That is the end of part three. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now it turns to part four. Part four. You are going to hear a talk about the English pubs. As you listen, complete the notes below. First, you have some time to look at questions 31 to 40.
Now listen carefully and answer questions 31 to 40. In English pubs, the food is usually plain but of good quality. In fact, to taste good traditional English food, you would do well to visit a reputable pub. Many businessmen habitually have lunch in a pub near their office. In the country, the pub is often part of an inn where you can put up for the night. The Englishman's favourite drink is beer. There are three different methods of serving beer in Britain. As you'd expect, some beer is served in bottles. Beer that comes from a tap is called draught beer, and there are two different methods of serving it. Keg beer is served with modern method, which uses a gas called carbon dioxide, and traditional draught has no gas in it, and a pump is used to pull the beer up the pipe and out of the tap. Keg beer is served colder than traditional draught. It's easier to look after, and some keg beers are sold almost everywhere in Britain. This means that you can always have exactly the same drink in any pub that sells a particular keg beer. Traditional British beer is probably quite different from the beer in your country. It has no gas in it, and it's not served very cold. But this is not a mistake. Traditional beer drinkers will tell you that this allows you to taste the beer better. Traditional draught is not always looked after as well as it should be, but in a good pub, a traditional draught beer drinker will tell you there can be no better drink. There are a lot of different breweries, companies that make beer, in Britain, but they make the same types of beer, and you can see them in the list below. Lager is the kind of beer that is common in many countries. Normally keg is served cold. Strong lager is often available in bottles. Bitter is the most popular kind of British beer. It tastes slightly bitter and can be keg or traditional draught. Most pubs have more than one kind. Guinness is a thick, almost black, bitter-tasting Irish beer. Pale ale is less strong and a bit sweeter than bitter and often is keg. Mild is a fairly sweet beer, often dark, not as strong as bitter. It can be keg or traditional. It cannot be found everywhere. Bottled beers are sometimes served cold. There are several kinds available. For example, light ale like pale ale. Brown ale is a brown, often rather sweet beer. Stout is a very dark beer. Law regulates the pub's opening times. Local variations are possible, but usually a pub is open from half past 11 to 3 o'clock and from half past 5 to half past 10 or 11 o'clock. Betting is forbidden in pubs. Children are not allowed on licensed premises, which may mean that father and mother cannot have a quiet drink together if children are with them. In the old days, when people drank too much and pubs were often rowdy, the law against children entering pubs was a wise one. Today, drunkenness is much less frequent than it was, say 50 years ago. It would be quite wrong to consider the average English pub as anything other than a respectable, friendly place that provides good drink, good food and a pleasant social atmosphere. Far too often the foreigner has read accounts of sordid 19th century drinking places, haunted by people whose one desire was to drink as much as they could afford as quickly as possible. That is the end of part four. You now have half a minute to check your answers.